questions. So welcome to my introduction about the new uh, ARM architecture, uh, the new ARM V8 64-bit ARM architecture. Uh, my name is Thomas Ross. I do embedded security and mobile security, uh, mostly in the direction of bootloaders and so on. And yeah, we're going to take a relatively short look at uh, what's new in the architecture and what changed and how does it make my job different and how uh, does it change the future of um, mobile exploitation uh, for example, for jailbreaks, for hyper, uh, hypervisor uh, evasion, and so on. <clears throat> so this is this is the basic roadmap of the history of the ARM architecture. It started with the with the relatively old ARM v5, ARM v6 uh, instruction set, and then on current mobile phones, you are most likely using uh, an ARM v7 based processor. Um, <clears throat> With ARMv8, it's, uh, ARMv8 is basically the biggest upgrade to the instruction set since it was invented. Uh, in in ARMv8, we have stuff like mandatory floating point. We have uh, a four-tier exception level based uh, architecture of hypervisors and so on. And if, if we look at most changes in uh, ARM 64-bit, it's really focused on high performance applications. So while, while the normal 32-bit ARM uh, is very good for small devices, for minimum power consumption devices, with ARM64 we can actually really do massive processing. Uh, a lot of the instructions contain stuff like hints for, the, uh, for pipeline optimization, for caching optimization, and so on. Um, we don't have the, the old CPU modes anymore. We now have so-called exception levels. We have virtualization built-in. Um, and yeah, the, the instruction are still 32-bit fixed length, though, so you're, you're not doubling your code size. We have much more registers. We have uh, a divide instruction, finally. If you have ever written embedded <laughs> ARM code, you will know what a pain it was to, to actually divide something in your bootloader. We have a compare and, uh, and jump instruction instead of, uh, instead of conditionals on each and every instruction. And we can still also run 32-bit uh, ARM code. So if, if we compare it to the old uh, instruction set, there, there are some main difference. Uh, for example, there's no more thumb mode. Thumb mode was an instruction set on ARM that basically was the normal instruction set sh shrink down to 16-bit 16, 16 instruction. It was very limited, but very small, and also uh, very good for compilers to generate because it, uh, it was so simple. <coughs> Another thing uh, that's missing now are conditionally uh, executing instructions. On ARM 32-bit, each instruction could have um, a condition in it. So you could, for example, have a block, instead of having uh, branches for comparison and so on for ifs and else, you could just have a four bit in the instruction set differently and it would uh, compare it per instruction. We also don't have a coprocessor anymore, uh, which is the thing that you used on, on old CPUs for your MMU configuration, for your entire power management setup, for your caching and so on. Um, the uh, the program counter is not writable anymore only by branching instructions, but we have uh, almost double the registers. <clears throat> if, you, if you want to get started with a bit of ARM64 development, there are some official ARM uh, simulators. There's the iPhone 5S, if you can get your code to execute on it. Uh, there's the Versatile Express, which is basically an FPGA-based uh, implementation of the ARM64, and there are some other bots. And also very cool is that uh, QEMU now has full support for, uh, actually since quite a long time, full support for uh, ARC64. <coughs> if you want to analyze binaries or generate binaries uh, and want to reverse engineer existing ARM64 code, most tools are already up to it. Uh, in IDA Pro 6, some months ago, there was an update that now supports ARM 64-bit GCC can generate and object dump uh, can disassemble the 
uh, the code. The Hopper Disassembler, which is a very, very nice and cheap uh, alternative to IDA Pro, has limited but working ARM64 um, uh, support. And if you want to debug something or want to test your shell code, you could just run it in QEMU and uh, are up in no time. <coughs> Alrighty, so let's talk about the, the architecture. Uh, if you've ever worked with normal ARM processors, you will know that you had like 16 registers, uh, w some of which were banked uh, between the different interrupt levels and so on. And now you actually have 30 general purpose registers and also a 31st register, which is either the stack point uh, or a zero register, depending on your, on your context. Um, <clears throat> for the, the first eight registers, which are unintuitively at the bottom of this slide, um, are for parameters and results in your, in your function sets and are never banked between calls. Um, the eighth is if you return a pointer and then you have uh, some six scratch registers, some, some inter-procedure call registers and so on. It's actually quite easy. The, the one that if you write exploits, will, you'll be comfort, confronted with the most will be register 30 and 29, which is the frame pointer and the link register. Uh, yeah, basically everything like before. Uh, a cool thing is that you can all registers can be used either in 64-bit mode or in 32-bit mode. So if you, for example, you have an integer implementation where you work with 32-bit uh, integers, it won't be slowed down by checks where, for example, if you rotate, rotate shift something, you, you have to copy over the, the first half uh, into the second because uh, you, you need 32-bit shifting. Uh, the instruction set has that all built in and you also have 32 additional floating point registers, which is useful if you're into science stuff. <laughs> so the, on the old uh, ARM CPUs, we had uh, the different modes. Basically, if your, your applications were always running in user mode, your operating system was uh, running in the system mode, and then some parts of your system might even run in the supervisor mode, which is a slightly enhanced system mode and so on. It was very, very difficult to, to build it for virtualization and so on, because if you, you, you only have uh, one fast interrupt handler and it's a dedicated CPU mode and so on, it's, it was a lot of overhead if you actually did real virtualization because uh, an interrupt was firing, you had to check what, uh, what VM am I in and what, what am I actually supposed to do? And you couldn't have a real hypervisor or monitor mode underneath your, your guest operating systems without a lot of overhead. Um, they get rid of that and now we only have four modes left. Uh, we have the, uh, whoops, sorry. Um, we, we have the uh, EL0, exception level zero, which is the unprivileged mode where your applications run in. We have the exception level one where your, inter your operating system, your kernel and so on runs in. Then we have a third um, exception level where your hypervisor, for example, your, on your desktop it would be your VMware or whatever runs in. And then underneath that we have another mode which is called the CQ monitor, um, which manages the state switch between the normal mode and the so-called secure state. <clears throat> uh, this, this graphic shows a bit how it could look on actual system. You have your applications in exception level zero. Basically, the, the lower your, uh, the exception level number is, the lower are your privileges. And for, um, for a normal service system, for example, it could look like this, that you have a hypervisor which is uh, VMware or whatever, or KVM, and then you have your guests, which would be uh, Linux, and then on top of that, your applications, and then also monitor mode, and the monitor mode can be called to switch into a secure state of the CPU. In the secure state, uh, exception level two is missing, but you can run a secure operating system which can provide functions to your guests, to your hypervisor, for example, for cryptography. So. Uh, if, even if your hypervisor is owned, your secure area won't be owned because uh, it's entirely dedicated and separated by this monitor layer, which is quite cool and, and quite similar to what we do today with, with Trust Zone. And I'm, I'm quite excited to see the first evasions from app to the bottom and up again on the right-hand side. <clears throat> 
All right. Um, each privilege level, except uh, exception level zero, can set what causes a level change. Basically, you, you could have a, a hardware button that causes the CPU to jump into exception level three, or you could have as soon as a, as a specific data access happen, your CPU can jump to, uh, to exception level two to your hypervisor, for example, to manage uh, direct memory access with hardware or whatever, and so on. Alternatively, you can also explicitly call down from your exception level, just never up. So exception level zero could just issue an SMC instruction and it would jump into the, uh, into the CQ monitor depending on on your exact configuration. It's quite cool because you can very finely configure what happens with the different permissions of the exception, exception level. So you can, even your operating system level can be very locked down and very limited in what it can do, which could be interesting for uh, if your hypervisor is like a microkernel or something. Um, yeah, there are also three different interrupt vectors for the exception level, so each Exception level has its own interrupt vector, can handle its own interrupts, and so on. And for example, an interrupt that, that happens while the CPU is in exception level zero could go into the exception level two, but then uh, the exception level determines, okay, I can I uh, check this uh, interrupt, I can give it up to the operating system again because it's nothing uh, they need to care about. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, the coprocessor, which is, which is uh, used to configure your MMU, your caching, and so on, is all now gone. It's basically not this architecture where you had a separate coprocessor in your head. It's now all done uh, via dedicated or system management instructions, which, yeah, it's, it's quite a nice change, and it's still backwards compatible. So you can even, if we, if we go to, to the slide, uh, you can even have guests that still run in... Uh, uh, ARM's 32-bit, but the hypervisor is ARM 64-bit, and the second guest is ARM 64-bit too. So it's it's really cool because you can just from the bottom up uh, change your architecture however you like. So you could even go and run 64-bit uh, ARM Linux or in 32-bit uh, ARM Linux, and the the old register banking that happened before is now uh, mapped onto the new registers. <coughs> Alrighty, um, for the for the three uh, for the three privilege levels, we obviously need to have different memory translations because each uh, your your uh, operating system must not run in the same address space as your second operating system, and so in the worst case, you have a three stage tr translation of your memory addresses from virtual to physical, um, which. Uh, seems to be fast enough, and it's it's quite cool because you can shift your your whole translation tables around, and each operating system still, without any any uh, penalty, can manage its own memory. No no need to call your hypervisor for doing all that stuff. <coughs> uh, yeah, the function prolog and epilog on on the uh, on ARM sixty four is a bit different to, to what happened before, because before on ARM32, you basically, when you went into a function, all the registers you were going to touch, you just banked them into, onto the stack uh, via a load, uh, via a store multiple register instruction. Uh, unfortunately, or why ever, <laughs> this instruction doesn't exist anymore. Now you can only store and load pairs of registers. So, uh, the compilers, even like even right now, compilers already optimize a lot in that direction. So they try to avoid using a lot of registers, even though they have a lot of of them available, because you you would have to have a lot of store pair instructions to store such registers. Um, but yeah, the the basic uh, <coughs> the the basic product just stores your uh, your link register and your frame pointer onto the stack configures the stack with the minus 32 uh, to reserve the space for your local uh, function variables and so on. And the, uh, the, the epilogue does the same just backwards. It loads your link register again. It loads your frame pointer again, adds 32 byte to the, uh, 32 byte to the stack and returns. The return instruction does nothing like on x86 where it 
pops addresses and so on, return really just sets the uh, program counter to the current content of the link register. So it's just an unconditional branch. It doesn't do any magic like on x86. <coughs> so if we, if we look at some example code um, of a very, very simple uh, ARM64 function, uh, which just takes an integer, calls another function, and adds to the result of that function. Uh, this would be what the current GCC without optimization would do. So it, it stores the current, uh, the current li link register and frame pointer. <coughs> it moves the current stack pointer into the, into the uh, frame pointer. It stores the argument that was supplied to the uh, to the function into uh, uh, onto the uh, onto the stack, uh, the the 16 is basically the offset to the frame pointer, and then it goes and call foo. Uh, the reason we copy the argument over is that we we can't be sure that uh, foo won't touch register zero because register zero is always used for return values. So uh, foo returns, we copy the return value into a register. Uh, we load our argument again. In this case, the compiler optimizes, optimizes a bit shitty. <laughs> we add them together and then just uh, store again, uh, restore our frame point, our link register, and return. Uh, it's, it's that easy. It's really a breeze to read because the amount of instructions you have to know is really low and it's yeah, very, very comfortable to write and read ARM64 code. <coughs> Alrighty, um, now as a very small demo of, uh, of how you can run ARM64 stuff on your, on your computer. Uh, well. Great, so I have a monitor down here that's... <laughs> um, Basically, we can just use the, the current QAMO uh, JIT hat has full ARC64 support, at least enough to, to boot a Linux on it. And if you, if you want to experiment with real ARM64 user land, you can even just get the uh, Linaro uh, builds and run them in QAMO. So for example, in this case, uh, all this stuff will be on my GitHub after this talk and if the internet in the hotel works today. Um, yeah, in this case, we can just boot up a Linux kernel in uh, ARM64 mode. And if the scrolling works, that would be great. Well. Well. Yeah, and now we can log in. This is the build route that's normally used by uh, to, to compile stuff for the architecture. And as you can see, we now have a, a test user land that runs in ARM64, and it's yeah, really easy to use. <laughs> <coughs> to look a bit at the reverse engineering workflow, um, I've also prepared a small demo of the Hopper disassembler. Um, for example, if we, this is a bit too big, I think. <laughs> So uh, in this case, this is part of the code we had before, just in this case, a, a whole executable. And I can now just uh, take the uh, hopper disassembler and load my binary in there. And it will immediately uh, oh, the screen is a bit small. It will immediately find all the symbols if included in the code. And I can just navigate the code and see that the code we, we had earlier is pretty much exactly what Hopper tells us it is now too. So it's really, really a breeze to, to navigate with the tools we already have. Uh, a lot of them will, will come, I'm sure. I, will, I also have some uh, IDA Pro scripts, which you can find on my GitHub, which allow you to, uh, to basically automatically search for ARM code, uh, ARM64 code in the blob. So for example, if you have a bootloader, and you uh, load it into your IDA Pro, you can run the script and it will look for the function epilogues and function uh, prologues automatically to see uh, functions in, in binary blobs where you have no idea if they are actually code or data and so on, and it tries to sort it a bit. <coughs> uh, 
Great. So um, for exploits on, on ARM64, unfortunately, we can't go in depth because of our time limitation, but I just want to, to give a very short overview on how it's a bit different from, from ARM32 in regard to uh, the, the stack offsets and so on. But overall, uh, it's ARM64 has the standard uh, mitigation technique, so you can't just, you don't just have an executable stack and heap on your operating systems. Uh, return to libc is not possible because at least the first eight arguments will be in registers and not on the stack. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, compared to ARM32, especially when you're working with, with bootloaders, we often have very small functions. Uh, it's difficult to find good gadgets to configure registers uh, as you want. Uh, it's, it's an important goal if you want to uh, be able to call random functions and not just return-oriented programming gadgets uh, to have a, a function which loads memory into registers because the load multiple instruction is now missing. Uh, most compilers don't generate nice gadgets for us anymore. So yeah, as, as I already said, return-oriented programming is the way to go, as always at the moment, and yeah. <coughs> uh, if we compare the epilogue of, the, of an ARM 32-bit executable and, and an ARM 64 uh, executable function, we see that in the, uh, ARM 32, the, uh, the program counter, the instruction pointer in the memory where, where the current code is executed, uh, was directly loaded from the stack. Uh, this is not possible anymore because on the new 64-bit architecture, the, the PC, the program counter is not writable anymore uh, and it can only be modified by instructions like, the, like branch instructions and return instructions. Uh, this is mostly, as I've been told by an ARM engineer, because of uh, pipeline stuff. Basically, the, the pipeline needs to be flushed on a return instruction and so on. And, even the return instruction signals to the CPU that this is not just an unconditional branch. You can do other optimizations because this is a return and so on. It's, it's quite fascinating. But yeah, it's, it's just important to know that basically we load the link address and the previous frame pointer from the stack and the return will jump onto the stack. <coughs> so this is... Um, very, very uh, strongly simplified version of uh, code from a specific bootloader which already run, runs on, on ARM64 and it basically uh, gives you, oops, I have the wrong code. Uh, no, oh no. Uh, it basically gave you the chance to uh, supply a recovery script that's booted on the first boot, but you had to have some authentication to actually run the do command function and so on. But I, I was able to find a stack overflow in the bootloader itself, which could be uh, used by, uh, by a, a USB protocol message where you can just have full control over the stack. And after a while I found this reverse engineered stuff in the bootloader, which basically allows me to execute whatever I want on the system, given that I can control the recover shell script, which I actually can. <coughs> so return-oriented programming basically means that we, we want to return from one function to another, and we control where we return to. So in this case, uh, we get, by overwriting the, the on stack link register, we get our code to jump to uh, the return statement here to uh, temp recover dot sh, uh, which will return the address of the string into register zero. And then we want to jump to the system call because then we can immediately execute the shell script listed above uh, because nicely the get recovery script function configured register zero very nicely for us with a path that we can even execute. So yeah, we, we want to jump to the address set, uh, set of the first instruction. So uh, then we want to return via the stack, via the frame that's stored on the stack to the system, and we have a root shell in this case. It was a very easy case, and it's on a quite an interesting device, but I can't get into more details yet as we are in responsible disclosure. Um, 
Yeah. So basically, what what we do, like on like we uh, on on most device on most modern exploits, we have a Stack Overflow. Above this, we overwrite the link register. We uh, we jump. Uh, we we write our own frame pointer, and after that, we put a second link register and frame pointer onto the stack. So under Stack Overflow is basically the uh, downwards growing stack, and we just configured our link register to uh, to point to the return statement of the get recovery script and our frame pointer. Uh, which which will be loaded by the return as the new link register and the new frame pointer address. Our frame pointer uh, points to a Stack Overflow controlled link register. So the return, instead of returning to whatever wherever we came from, will actually return to the system statement and give us the possibility to execute whatever we want. Um, and that's basically it. Just a basic overview over the ARM64 instruction and set. Um, I hope you have fun and thank you. Uh, are there any questions on, on the topic or just bug me later here? Uh, all right, thank you. <laughs>